I said, you say that Jesus was a good man. He said, he was the best. And you say that he was a supreme example and a great moral and ethical teacher. He was. And I said, do you believe that Jesus of Nazareth was more ethical and more moral than you? Oh, I've no doubt about that whatsoever. And I said, do you really think that he was a better man as men go than you? He said, oh, I think so, yes, unquestionably. I said, can you give me one reason why I shouldn't believe him rather than you? <laughs> Just one. I said, because when I put you next to Jesus, out of your own mouth, you're lost. He took the pipe out of his mouth and looked at me for a moment, and I said, you said it, Doc. I didn't. And you know the Unitarians are saying it, and we missed the point. They're so eager to try and have rapport with some concept of Christianity and the label of Jesus that they are digging their own intellectual graves and they don't recognize it. How come if he is so great they haven't listened to him? How come if he really is the supreme ethical and moral example that have not followed him? And if he is so much more dependable than they are, why should we listen to them? Why not to him? You see, the Summa Apologia, the Supreme Apologetic, always has been, always will be, the person of the Master. The instant that he appears in contrast with all philosophy, it disintegrates. The moment he appears in contrast with all human systems, they disintegrate. The moment that he stands beside any man, no matter how noble, they are seen for what they really are. Mere humans who in comparison to him have accomplished nothing in the history of the world who for the love of them will go to the uttermost parts of the earth to carry not an ethical and moral structure, but to carry instead the message of a redemption that transforms the soul and that produces ethics and morality because the soul has been changed, not as a means to the change of the soul. The ultimate appeal this is the person of the Master. I think when we recognize this, we are in a position to deal with the Unitarians for the first time. We can show from the Bible many truths, but until we are able to force them to the recognition that they're forever quoting the Bible and ignoring its basic message, we'll never communicate with them. This particular Unitarian and others that I've dealt with, all follow the same pattern. Acknowledgement of the supremacy of Christ, but then backing away from the teaching of Christ. They will quote, by their fruit you will know them. They will quote, as you would have all men do unto you, so do unto them. They will pick and choose out of the New Testament whatever pleases them. By what authority? They like it. It's a purely subjective reasoning process. Now, if you're going to take the golden rule, why don't you take something else too? Why do you want the Jesus that's picking up the babies and nestling them in his arms, and you don't want the Jesus who says, you will not come to me, that you might have life? I would have gathered you to me as a hen gathers her brood, but you would not. These shall go away to everlasting punishment, but the righteous to life eternal. That Jesus is not wanted. But the Jesus that can be gouged out of the New Testament and then carefully reassembled with a rationalistic erector set 
and then presented to the world as an ethical and moral example is what the Unitarians want. And the only way the church can combat it is to ask, in effect, will the real Jesus Christ stand up? And the real Christ is the Christ who is able to transform the lives of men. We go back into the history of Unitarianism. Have they ever created in their entire history, ever, a major mission work throughout the world? The answer is no. Have they ever created in all history anything to resemble the missionary force of the Christian church? No. Are they concerned with the estate of men's souls? No. Because they're universalists. Everybody who follows his own light is going to get there. So why be concerned about anybody? Then why, of course, did Christ say go into all the world and make disciples? This is tacitly ignored. Now, I would like to offer, beyond the person of our Lord, some interesting methods that may be helpful in witnessing to Unitarians. First, it is important that we show the reliability of the scriptures. In order to do that, one of the things which has great impact is prophetic fulfillment. It is therefore important to recognize that there are prophecies in the Old Testament which did come to fulfillment on schedule. Not messianic prophecies now, but prophecies concerning specific events where God said something was going to happen, and it happened. And you can see it today with your own eyes. And the approach to the person who does not believe in the supernatural origin of the Scriptures is to place it in terms of a proposition and to say to them, supposing, just supposing, that I were to be able to tell you two or three hundred years in advance that a specific city in a specific nation was going to undergo a specific kind of destruction. And I described it for you in detail, even down to the dust of the city and its final disposal. What would you think of that kind of knowledge if, after you checked it out, it came to pass exactly that way? The person has to say, well, the two or three hundred year gap precludes any possibility of your having arranged it because you'll be dead. And there has to be some source of information that you have access to. I don't know what it is, but it's got to be extraterrestrial or supernatural. Well, then one need but go into the Scriptures to the city of Tyre. Well documented in archaeology. The Christians ought to have good archaeology books that are up to date to demonstrate these things and to show how the prophecy against Tyre was given by the prophet Ezekiel. And the prophecy said that even the dust of the city would be scraped into the sea and it would never again be rebuilt. You can sail by the site of the city of Tyre today and you can see on the cliffs around the city that nothing has ever been built on that site again. What happened to it? exactly what the prophecy said. They blasphemed the Lord and he brought judgment on them in the form of Alexander the Great who arrived at Tyre in his quest to conquer the world and the Tyrrhenians had the consummate gall to tell him that they wouldn't surrender. And Alexander became very angry and he announced that he would conquer Tyre no matter how long it took. So he attacked the city and laid siege to it and when it looked as if the city was going to collapse, then Alexander, smelling triumph in the air, made a mistake. He forgot that they had an offshore island, 
and that they had the means of carrying the people from the city to it. His navy was not there. They loaded their people on the boats at night and sailed off, and Alexander breached the walls of Tyre, and when he got there, nothing. That made Alexander very mad. And so he ordered the city to be destroyed down to its foundations. And when that was not enough, he had the foundations torn up and the rocks on which the city was built scraped off into the ocean, including the literal dust. And with the ruins of the city, he built a causeway to the island and destroyed everybody there. And Tyre never rose again. Who told the prophet this? What information did he have? Certainly not Gene Dixon's crystal ball. <laughs> Certainly not Edgar Casey's trances. Oh no, this is biblical prophecy. And it must be reckoned with. There's nothing like it in history. These are things Christians ought to know. Christians ought to know that God pronounced a curse on the city of Hazor and said, It will become the habitat of lizards when I'm finished with it. And nobody will inhabit Hazor anymore forever but the lizards. Now, you can go to Hazor today, and you know who lives there? Tons and tons of lizards. And they're all over the place. You can see them today. 2,700 years later. Lizards, 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 lizards everywhere. <laughs> now, God left them there for a reason. When he says it becomes something, it becomes these are instances of biblical prophecy of sound nature. The great prophecy of Daniel concerning the Messiah in Daniel chapter 9 works out exactly within one year to the advent of Jesus of Nazareth because we have unearthed the archaeological evidence that dates the reign of Artaxerxes Longimanus. And we now know from Ezra chapter 7 the date of the decree to go forth and rebuild Jerusalem. 457 to 458 B.C. And you take your 490 years of Daniel and add it on. And you end up at the advent of Jesus Christ's ministry. And no archaeologist on earth can get out from under it. Because it's there. Who else was born then? It shall be 483 years until Messiah the Prince but from the time of the building of the walls of Jerusalem. I was to appear on a panel show a few years ago, and I decided to check out that prophecy because I was appearing with a rabbi. And I knew the rabbi would be anything but friendly towards me uh, in view of my position on Christianity. And I checked with then professor of archaeology at Johns Hopkins, William F. Albright, who's now dead, to find out the documentation on Daniel 9 and the dates of Ezra chapter 7. And he fixed the date absolutely at 458 B.C. And I said, well, I understand that there are some who say 457. He said, well, give or take a year. 457, 458. I said, do you know, Dr. Albright, what that places us at? He said, no, what does it place us at? I said, if you add up the 70 weeks of years, it comes out to 490 years. He said, so? I said, it comes out to 27 A.D. There was dead silence on the end of the telephone. I said, who else could this mean but Jesus of Nazareth? He said, I never get involved in time prophecies. Now, this is a classic illustration of don't confuse me with the facts. I have already made up my mind. <laughs> Now, you will run into this with people who do not believe, but the evidence is still there. I suggest that we be familiar with the archaeological evidence of biblical prophecy because it's good. And I could spin off 10 or 15 other illustrations of it, but it's there. 
And you want to get your hands on good material and use it. You want to authenticate the reliability of the Scriptures. And you ought to be grateful to God that we have such an accurate text. For when they unearthed the scroll of Isaiah, which is dated reliably 150 years before the birth of Jesus of Nazareth, and that scroll contains only minute variations from the text of Isaiah that we have today, you recognize the fantastic accuracy of the Old Testament prophets. They really believed they were getting God's Word, and they were. And they wrote it down very carefully, just to make sure nobody made any mistakes. And if they made one mistake on a page, they destroyed the page and wrote it over. You can see that scroll in Jerusalem. I just saw it. I was over there a few months ago. And there it sits, and it's accurate. You know, Isaiah 53 is still there. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. Who is it? For the transgressions of my people, the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the world. These are things we can do with archaeology and prophecy, the validation of history. And we can point out the ultimate value of a transformed life. The living Christ saves dying men. This doesn't happen in Unitarianism. They don't go and reform the drug addicts and the prostitutes. They don't transform the dregs of society because they have no transforming message. You won't find the Unitarian ministers trying to transform anybody with the gospel according to Unitarianism because nobody's going to buy the ethical and moral standards of Jesus if you've got a corpse stuffed ignominiously somewhere in a Palestinian graveyard. But if you're going to preach the gospel of resurrection and the good news that he's alive and that he's able to touch today because he's alive today, then it's possible to go out into the world and make disciples of all nations. If we're going to communicate with the Unitarians, we're going to have to communicate with them on the basis of transformation, on the basis of fact, on the basis of biblical prophecy, on the basis of common sense, why not Jesus? Look at the mess the world is in without him. Now, it's possible to go into Unitarianism and to point by point refute it in the areas of its theology. I don't think that's necessary. What is necessary is this, that you recognize that the people today who have adopted Unitarianism have adopted one of the most dangerous of all maxims, our relativism in ethics and morality. There is no absolute criteria. And where there is no absolute criteria of morality, inevitably there is disintegration. And when a culture has no absolute governing it, particularly a divine absolute, almost all forms of barbarism are possible. And there are those who tell us, and they are Unitarians, who hold the same position. It's not necessary to have faith in God or belief in a divine absolute in order to have order in society. It's quite significant that the societies that have attempted to maintain order without it are long buried. And the Soviet Union that tried it under Joseph Stalin began to see that disintegration, so it had to return to an absolute morality and an absolute ethic based upon a puritanical morality of Christian principles whose God they denied. Very strange, but true. Our relativism in ethics and morality destroys a culture. That's what's given us the playboy philosophy today. The idea that nothing is really good or bad, it's the use that we put it to. Once we accept this premise, once we accept that there is no absolute authority, then we become the absolute authority. And I would draw your attention to this in closing. There is one time in history that I can point to that should be in all your memories. Those of you who are young because of the history books and those of you who are older because you can remember it. 
when an absolute standard of morality was set up by a state. And that state created Dachau, Auschwitz, Belsen, and Buchenwald and systematically murdered six million people. Nazi Germany. No Unitarian, no relativist in morals or ethics could have raised their voice against Adolf Hitler that day. Because, you see, the culture makes it absolute. There is no God. And if the state really wanted to kill those people because they were inferiors, what possible line of reasoning could be raised against them? If there's no absolute morality and it's relative, how can you object to it? Maybe the Nazis were right. Who are we to say? Oh, that's incredible. That's terrible. That's evil. You can't kill six million people. That's wrong. Why? If you have no absolute criterion of morality and ethics, who is to say it's wrong? Nobody. And the world is today, and I want you to think on this, the world is today on that boat. The Jews have a sign in the back of their cars in Israel and here. It says, never again. Well, I want to tell you something. Yes, again and again and again and again. Not only with them, but with everybody else too. Because the mentality that can say there is no absolute except that which is dedicated and directed by the state rests upon a relativism in ethics and morality. And that's here. It's in our own culture right now. If you don't think it's here, go down to your high schools and your colleges where they're teaching occultism and witchcraft and you can't have prayer and Bible reading. They will teach satanic religion in the schools, but not gospel. Something is peculiarly wrong in our structure. When we are willing to undermine the structure in order to say that everybody has a right to pursue his own path. And these are the issues that we face. And the Unitarian philosophy pervades this culture on many levels. It is my hope and prayer that we have enough compassion in Christ to want to reach out to these people and to tell them Jesus Christ is God's absolute, not an iron fist but incarnate love. God really did love the world. He really did send his son. There really is hope. And that hope is able to transform. That's the answer, both now and in every age. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank thee that you have not left us alone in madness and in sin. But you have saved us, not by any works of righteousness which we've done, but wholly in accordance with your mercy. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty, everlasting God, we pray for those who are ensnared in Unitarianism and in the philosophy which stems from it. A lethal relativism that will draw men to destruction and that gives birth to all forms of absolutes which are grounded not in thee, but in the forces of darkness. Deliver us from these things and give us a great love to those who are trapped and taken captive by Satan at his will. Oh, send us forth, Lord, to be thy witnesses, in deed and in truth, as well as in word, in Jesus' name. Amen.